protect the asset. That's the rule. You are the asset. And if you don't protect the asset, then you aren't going to be able to make the higher contribution that you want to make. If you just think it's all about doing and none about recuperating, this is not sustainable. There's a certain point effort will get you to, but after that, it's your ability to recuperate better than other people. Don't do more today than you can recuperate fully from by tomorrow. And if you keep that single rule over time, then you have a tremendous competitive advantage over all those that are just overexerting. They'll burn out. How do I have an edge if it's just about not going harder than most of them are willing to? <laughs> well, there's two things to, 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 to break apart here. Okay, so the first is, is it true that putting in more effort gives you an edge over the people that don't put in more effort? And of course, it is true under some circumstances. There's lots and lots of evidence to support that. But even there, one has to be careful because you can't just, you can't just take an example of someone who's put in massive effort, got massive results, and take from that, well, therefore, you have, if you put in massive effort, you'll get massive results. Because what it doesn't allow for is all the, all the bodies along the way. So you can find an entrepreneur, and we, we could certainly do it together. It wouldn't take much that work 120-hour weeks kind of thing, 100 hours perpetually, and so on, and go, well, that's what it takes. And it's like, yeah, but I can point out for every one of those, we can find a million examples of people who started to do that. And what they actually got was in debt, broken relationships, broken health, and they didn't get written up in, you know, in the ink magazine because there's no story, there's no success. Right. Just the hook. So you have to be careful in any, any strategy one recommends. One has to look at not just the successes of that strategy, but all the people who failed pursuing the same strategy. So that's like the first thing one has to be at least wary of. And then the second thing I want to break apart from what you're saying is, is like, even if it's true that a certain message gets you, you know, off the couch, you know, and run it, get up and run, you're not running, you got to do something, right? Like, so even if a certain message gets you moving, one has to be careful about how long it is relevant for. Yeah. For example, as I work with insecure overachievers, one of the things I notice is that, well, a friend of mine pointed this out. Let me just share the story. So this is an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, he was one of the first people to help create a company that uh, provided for-profit microloans. Mm -hmm. So microloan had been established, but, but they said, well, how do you scale it? And they said, well, actually, we know how to scale things. You just have to bring in the right sort of management consulting from the outside, you get the right uh, you know, uh, investors involved so you can scale it that way and you do it for profit. That's the difference. And at first it was like seen, you know, it was being criticized, but eventually it, it just grew into like multi-billion dollars worth of this stuff. And he's traveling, he's in three continents a week. I mean, he's just like living the dream. He feels he's doing what matters and so on. And one day he, he's just asleep at night and, it, it, and he heard a gunshot go off. So he wakes up in bed. He's looking around like, what happened? And his wife's still asleep. His kids are still asleep. So he's like, okay, I guess I dream, dreamt it. A couple of days later, it happens again in the middle of the night. Then it happens a few days later in the middle of the day. And he's like, okay, something is off, right? You know, physically something's off. And he goes to the doctors and they say, they do a bunch of tests. And, and it's more complicated than this. But one of the things he said is, you, you got to sleep, you have to rest, you know, like you're pushing yourself so past the point of, of healthy renewal that it's, you know, your body's having to use up resources that, that, that it can't, re, you know, recuperate from. So, you, you know, you're burning out. And so he says, he says, like as a classic overachiever, he says, I don't need six weeks like you're telling me, I'll do this in two weeks. Like I'll recover right. faster than anyone else. And so he goes home, he's like, okay, I'm going to sleep. And he was amazed to find he could sleep 16 hours a day. And at the end of two weeks, he goes, oh, I'm still not recovered. I clearly do have an issue. And he crawls back to the doctor. He's like, okay, what do I have to do? Well, what he had to do eventually was take out like a couple of years of like recovery. He had to step aside as CEO of his business. And he, he just broke his heart to have to do that. And he summarized this. He's talking to a, a, a group of leaders as he was sharing this with us. And he said, I'll summarize the whole lesson this way. Protect the asset. That's the rule. 
you are the asset. And if you don't protect the asset, then you aren't going to be able to make the higher contribution that you want to make in the world. If you just think it's all about doing and none about recuperating, then it's a, it's a false, you know, this is not sustainable. And he added one more observation, which comes directly to your point that you were making before, which is, which is he said, if you tell an insecure overachiever to run a marathon, they know how to do that. They know how to set the target, make it happen, get going, show the progress, put it on social media, all the rest. He said, they know how to do that. If you tell an, an insecure overachiever to go take a nap, they don't know how to do that. That's counter to the whole way that they've been developed and programmed. And, and that's the real challenge. And so now that comes back, what you said originally, you said, you said if, you, if, you, if it's not true that more effort gives you an edge, well, what is, what do we do with that? Because the whole thing's spinning upside down now. And that's my, my response to you is, is yes, there's a certain point effort will get you to, but after that, it's your ability to recuperate better than other people, to mm. keep your mind sharper and clearer than other people. It, 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 and if I put it in one rule, it would be this rule. It's don't do more today than you can recuperate fully from by tomorrow. And if you keep that single rule over time, then you have a tremendous competitive advantage over all those that are just overexerting. They'll burn out, they're burnouts. Maybe it won't happen in six months, maybe it's three or four years. I mean, think, take podcasting. Here we are having podcasting, it's totally true. The number of people, I think the stats are something like only 10% of podcasts outlive three episodes. Yeah. Those that survive, only 10% only of that lives past 20 episodes. Mm -hmm. And so there is tremendous competitive advantage in being able to maintain a consistency over time. And that's not simply a matter of more effort. It's actually a matter of, of, of building boundaries that protect our tendency to over effort things so that we're here tomorrow, you know, still here 10 years later, still here, still contributing. Mm -hmm. And so, so to me, it's a more, it's a, it's a, it's not that what you're arguing, I think is inherently wrong or always wrong. I'm not arguing that but that there's a, a certain shelf life to it. And then you have to go discover, let's say, entrepreneurship 2.0 or 3.0 right. in order to be able to continue to make progress, but without burning out. Can you kind of explain essentialism, the, the book, but also just the idea? Um, essentialism is contrasted to non-essentialism. You can be an essentialist or a non-essentialist. And often we you know, jump between the two, but what non-essentialists think, what they do, what they get is completely different than essentialists. A non-essentialist basically believes that everything's essential. They have to try, therefore, to do everything all the time reactively. Uh, they, they fall into what Jim Collins has called the undisciplined pursuit of more. And as a result, they don't get what's on the packaging. They don't actually achieve everything they want to achieve. What happens is they burn out without... Uh, without getting the results they want. They tend to uh, feel out of control. They're not even sure if the most important things uh, got done today, uh, lying in bed at the end of the day. They've done all these different things, but they feel like, well, my to-do list is longer now than it was at the beginning of the day. And I, I just don't have the sense of satisfaction. You know, So it's a sort of a, an unsatisfying way to live. Uh, the essentialist is in contrast to this and is counter-cultural. Uh, what they believe, the mindset, that they're looking at the world through is less but better, that only a few things are essential and almost everything is uh, trivial noise. And so what they do differently is that they pursue, well, it's a disciplined pursuit of less. Uh, they're constantly trying to select just the most important things from the trivial many. They're eliminating as much of the non-essential as possible. They're creating systems to make effort, uh, execution as effortless as possible. And so as a result, they're living a life that matters. Uh, they're having more joy in the journey. They know confidently the right things are getting done every day. And, and so this is the contrast, right? What they see, what they do, what they get is really different. And, and it seems to have had resonance and uh, the power of relevancy for people. And I would say that's increased over the last uh, year and a half with the pandemic and everything that's been going on. So one of the, the terms that I've heard uh, when I, I've read read some you know like reviews and, and summaries and such about uh, essentialism and then you just use the term uh, I think you use the term the trivial many 
Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I hired my first business coach back in 2009, I want to say, and one of the very first things exercises we did was separating the vital few from the trivial many. <laughs> is, is, is that... Is that vernac is that a vernacular that's just out there in the world, or are those your terms that the, that have kind of become almost memes in in professional development? Um, I I think that uh, the, the vital few and trivial many are, is language originally from the efficiency um, you know contributors and thinkers uh, when when people were really uh, you know the very first before you had management consulting as you do today. You had sort of these efficiency experts and they were using a scientific approach to try and improve quality. So it was part of the first quality improvement movements okay. that, that were largely ignored in the United States, uh, but, but were found a receptive audience in, in, uh, in Japan. And I mean, just carrying this through, the, the, you know, at the time, we don't really remember this now, but it, it, Japanese products at that time were known for being cheap but low quality. Uh, it may be similar, which again is a bit of a stereotype, but similar as you might have with, you know, made in China still right, is, right. What's cheap, but it might not be as, as, as high quality. That's of course changing. But, but suddenly Japan, when they were embraced this, this quality movement of saying, look, basically the, the what they discovered the, these experts was that if you could improve just the right few things, you didn't have to try to improve everything. But if you could find the right few problems and address them, the vital few things, you could massively increase quality without massively increasing cost. And, and as I say, in the US, it was like, ah, oh, we're not really bothered with all of this. We're sort of leading in all, leading in the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the car economy and, and, and uh, in a whole variety of air, industries. So there was no sort of pain point, but in Japan, there was a great pain point and they embraced it. And this is how, how it literally shifted Japan into becoming at one time the second largest economy in the world, uh, known for its quality all around the world, suddenly taking over uh, the car industry globally. It all came back to this single idea. So this idea, this, this, this you know, less but better uh, is something that can revolutionize economies, uh, societies. And, and of course, what I'm focused on is, is how it can revolutionize the quality of someone's life. Mm -hmm. uh, and their relationships and their four from their their teams and their business and so on. So that term, uh, you know, when you said that, I thought, okay, is that's that's basically lean manufacturing is kind of I think that I, that thing that sourced from I think Toyota, and I, I forget the story, but some there was some American guy that went over there and learned all about it and brought it back. Um, and then there's this concept of kaizen. Um, that I think is pretty interlinked is that that's pretty much what you're talking about is that that movement and I'm not speaking about with any authority because I don't have it but <laughs> yeah exactly but you're exactly right still uh, and so eventually after after it was transformative you know within Japan it was then you know a little paradoxically outsourced back into uh, into American manufacturers uh, that suddenly we're saying, okay, there is a different way of doing this. And mm -hmm. so by that point, it became known, I mean, Toyota was certainly one of the most famous uh, companies for this. Uh, and and it, it, the Toyota way became significant. And, and I don't know, this is a little getting a little meta, but, but Toyota actually started themselves to fall into, literally fall into what Jim Collins has called the undisciplined pursuit of more. So his analysis where he used that language is he was studying great companies that were falling from their greatness. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, in a book that was a, the, the, probably the least read of, of, of Jim's books, uh, but, but I, I really love it. And it's, it's called How the Mighty Fall. He identifies five phases that, that once successful, once great companies go in, mm -hmm. undisciplined pursuit of more is one of them, but there's a, it goes on and stage four is where you're, uh, you're, you're suddenly grasping for salvation because you suddenly become aware, oh, we have a problem, but we don't know what to do about it. And quite famously, the CEO of Toyota, this is a few years ago now, uh, but, but wrote to his own employees saying, we are at stage four as mm. a company. And it was his, I mean, in part, his attempt as a wake up call, but maybe it was also just you know, him stating reality as he saw it. But, but this is sometimes the risk of, of you know, success. Success can become a catalyst for failure. 
uh, because it, it often masks problems that are happening under the surface. And I observed this myself in Silicon Valley companies and they, they seem to go through a predictable pattern that they would be focused in the first phase and then that would lead to success and the success would breed so many options and opportunities that they would start to plateau in their progress or fail altogether because they, you know, like success breeds so many options that, that it, you, you become disfocused. It undermines the very things that led to success. Well, that was a pattern I noticed. I call it the, the paradox of success. Uh, but I didn't just notice it in companies. I also noticed it in individuals within those companies that we individually can start taking on so many things that we start to feel, well, we wouldn't say plateauing in our progress. We wouldn't use that language, but but people start to feel busy, but not necessarily productive. Uh, they feel stretched too thin at work or at home. They feel like their life is turned into something where, where they're just constantly hijacked by other people's agenda for them. Mm -hmm. and, and all of this is a, a personalized example of this business uh, phenomenon. Uh, and, and that's something I think people, you know, everywhere seem to be, uh, be able to relate to now. So was that, was that the impetus for the book was to take these, you know, what were, were fundamentally business principles and try to bring them into the essence of individual life? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I, the, the place I play uh, is sort of where business meets personal. Uh, and so I work, continue to work with uh, you know, basically all of the major tech companies, but also across industries. Now I'll work with organizations uh, but what, I, what I'm always drawn to is ideas that can work at whatever level of, of, of human application you want to apply them to. Mm -hmm. so, so you can apply them. I mean, actually, it's more than just a thought experiment. These ideas, if they're true ideas about how human flourishing and failure work, then it can work at the societal level. It can work at the organizational, team level, interpersonal level, personal level, or even intrapersonal level right so within so i'm always interested that's a i don't often describe or talk about this but i'm always interested at finding something that works at every extrapolation and yeah. that it remains true uh, and so I, I find it you know i find it especially fascinating where you can see things that run like a th gold thread through all of it and so somebody can then apply it at any level they want once they have the mindset they can say, okay, well, how do I apply this to just me and my life? How can I apply it to my relationships, my teams, my business, and so on? Uh, and essentialism is a, is a, is a you know, a, 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 in pursuit of that kind of application. And, and so is effortless as well. But, but, you know, both books are trying to say, this is something that applies, you know, the full spectrum, uh, the full stack of, of human experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I, feel, I feel right at home. There, that's an interesting statement you made because I, I find myself doing that a lot um, where I'm trying to take, because I, I, you know, my work, I teach entrepreneurship and I, and I teach entrepreneurialism, which I don't think are the same thing. Mm -hmm. One's a, you know, a, a vocation and one's a philosophy, if you will. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, what I'm always, what I'm really, I mean, even the name of this show, what I'm interested in is unlocking human potential. And I, I just happen right. to think that entrepreneurship is a great crucible in which to do that. But I'm yeah. always looking for ideas, like you're saying that, you know, kind of these uni, like unified field ideas that work at the macro and the micro. Um, and, and, and even like, like I, I'm like, I'm listening to a book right now on like quantum, quantum physics. Yes. Because there's these things that happen in little tiny scales that uh that are are like i think really profound truths about human right. existence and i'll share one of my little kind of casual examples the the heisenberg only because you're the only other person i've ever talked to who said the same thing about finding yeah. these ideas that scale right. through all levels of human experience the heisenberg uncertainty principle says that you cannot simultaneously measure the location and the momentum of a particle and so, you know, if you, if, you, if you take a snapshot of the momentum of a particle, in other words, its trajectory and its acceleration, it creates a wave uh, a equation that makes for variable location. But if you try to, if you actually quantize the location, it creates a wave uh, formula that creates variable momentum. Right. So, and I actually think that's how we are, that if we actually right. try to stop and figure out where we are in time and space, 
we lose momentum. And right. it's actually more important to be focused on our momentum and our trajectory and our acceleration. And, and that actually gives us almost kind of a stoicism about the present because it doesn't matter. It's only about where we're headed. So anyway, that's an example, but. Yeah, but it's so fun, right? Because all truth can be cir circumscribed into one great whole. So it's all interrelated. Mm -hmm. And and so and so I, f I find it endlessly fascinating, uh, you know, to be able to try and connect the dots. I'm I'm doing some new research now um, that uh, that that has you know has me absolutely fascinated, and it's it's seeing the world through a particular lens and and rediscovering everything through that lens. Essentialism did that by saying, look, what if you looked at the world through only those things that are most important? In, in the book Effortless, I'm trying to do that by saying, look, what if you looked at the world through the lens of how can how can I make these things? How am I making everything harder than it needs to be? Mm -hmm. There's the phenomenon of over overthinking and over complicating and over straining and forcing things, and and it's an error that people make who are part of the hit squad, right? The hardworking, intelligent, talented group of people. They're going to have a set of errors that are different to people who who could be typified, you know. And I, I don't really like. To typify anyone this way, but maybe someone who's kind of more lazy or more more hesitant to take action, they're going to have a different set of problems. Mm -hmm. So, it, but 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 a successful set of problems doesn't make it less of a problem. You still have to figure out how to be successful at success, and so so effortless is a, an attempt at that, and I think it has relevance because because successful people have dealt with the last eighteen months in predictably in a predictable set of ways. So they have done it, you know, the highly engaged people that are on the edge of exhaustion even before the pandemic have doubled down on the assumptions that they believe will lead to greater success. And in a lot of cases, it has led to success. I mean, I'm working with CEOs all the time, literally, literally, let's say maybe double or even triple the demand of where I was at pre-pandemic. So I'm having conversations constantly with leaders who are, facing this oddity of our success. we've actually had incredible results but man people are being burned out and we can see people leaving that we'd rather not have leave and we're seeing the turnover so the results are still uh, on the surface look great but they're very concerned about well we can't sustain this for another 18 months so there's a hunger for saying how can we how can we get breakthrough results but without burning everybody out yeah. And, and that's a non-trivial problem because if you've been rewarded for harder and harder work in your life, and if you've actually got great, you know, sort of set of results over the last 18 months through pushing harder and doing more, and you, there's no more room, you've run out of space, you're running out of energy, and yet the pressure is to still go higher. And so I th think about this as, the, um, as a 10x dilemma, which is that overachievers want kind of all the time to get 10x results, but no overachiever can work 10x harder. And once you put those together, once you face that dilemma, you, 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 the reason for writing effortless becomes self-evident. The reason for reading it becomes self-evident because you go, well, I have to find an easier, smarter, simpler, better path to better results. And I need to stop distrusting the easy just because I think hard work as a virtue doesn't mean easy. Ease has to be a, a vice, you know, that, that, that easy does not equal lazy. It's like you suddenly have to open yourself up to this whole possibility and this, this, this different, I think, counterintuitive paradigm. It's counterintuitive for anyone who's an insecure overachiever, of which there are many, yeah, let's say the majority, maybe everyone. I, th I think you're probably talking to one, frankly, so I hope you don't mind <laughs> if, we, if we camp on this idea for a while because yeah. I need some therapy. Yes, well, we do, but that's the right word for it in a sense, because, because once you become a certain level of a performer, no one's talking to you about, about these subjects because, and in fact, if you listen to sort of any of the, let's say the majority of the 1980s kind of thinking, no pain, no gain, give everything, right. do more, you can kill it. Like all of that language will actually hurt your performance. It's good from zero to, to 60, but it's really bad from 60 and beyond. And so what gets you here won't get you there.
But if you try to do more of what got you here, then what will end up happening is that you end up paying a great price, your price in your health. You'll be sleeping less and less and you, it, it will pay, pay a price in your most important relationships. It's absolutely predictable because they're like, man, there's nothing ever enough. And it, it just more and more and no more, more and more time and more and more effort. We matter less and less. So it damages relationships. So it burns yourself out physically, but it doesn't stop there. It burns out your relationships and it can even burn out whole companies because it's all this, you know, it's this one paradigm. I liken it sometimes to bloodletting. Right. For 3000 years, yeah. now, don't get me started on bloodletting. I started and I shouldn't have done. But 3000 years from 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 ancient uh, Greece, you know, well, Egypt originally, Greece mm -hmm. came through Rome. It came into the Middle Ages, into the whole of Europe. This thing, you know, there's evidence. I didn't know this till recently. There's evidence to suggest that King Charles II was effectively killed. I'm exaggerating it, but effectively killed by bloodletting. He had a seizure and they just took 24 ounces of blood from him, weakened his whole system, so finished him off. And also George Washington. I bet you didn't know that. I've never mm -hmm. heard that before. I've read a lot about the, the, the founding fathers, but that, that was part of the complication of his treatment at the end of his life was that they, they were performing bloodletting on him. Uh, and of course, this did almost no one any good. The, the, the dominant paradigm for 3,000 years and the whole time it's false, the whole time it's fake. And the same thing happens for overachievers is that they've got this narrative, this story. And, and it, it's, it's just basically it's a con. It's basically not, or at least it's an incomplete picture. It's an incomplete narrative. Mm -hmm. we have to upgrade our way of a sophistication of thinking. And, and one of the ways we upgraded, again, surprisingly, perhaps, is by discovering simpler, easier strategies for success just to discover that that's that, that those are acceptable and that they're in fact absolutely vital if we want to achieve our highest point of contribution so okay man this is this is rich soil all right we're gonna if, if you will i'd love to stay here for a minute like i said yeah. so so as somebody that i think is the the quintessential you know, embodiment of what you're describing. Like in the last 18 months, our company's grown 5,000%. Like we're a, we're a three, not even three-year-old startup. So year one was kind of like, yeah, let's prove the concept, sell some courses. People want to become entrepreneurs. We'll teach them some marketing basics, whatever. And then uh, in the last year and a half, we've, you know, now we have, we've had 200,000 students. We're one of the biggest private you know, bootstrapped education companies in the world from a, from a growth perspective. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's interesting because the company culture and the company, but both internal culture, but also like our, our product itself is a sort of culture because we're, we're teaching a framework and a set of, of ideas that people are using to, to, to pivot in their whole life into yep. entrepreneurship a lot of them coming out of employment or, or you know, more traditional yeah, yeah. Uh, pathways. And so it, a lot of the ethos of what we do is kind of built on this like energizer bunny spark plug intensity that Jeff brings and Jeff teaches and Jeff stands for and Jeff pounds his fists for because he gets enraged when he sees people wanting to be lazy slackers all around and just want more <laughs> for less. And so I'm right. like, I'm like sitting here going, oh my gosh, what if Greg's right? But here's, but here's the thing. This is like what all my, all my ego is, is screaming right now and saying, yeah, but if you want what most people don't have, you know it's going to require doing what most people won't do. And the one thing that you can control is your effort. And if you'll take your effort to a place you know that most people won't, then it only stands to reason you'll get the outcome most people won't. Now, if what Greg is saying is true, and I need to buy into this whole work smarter, not harder thing. H how do I get an edge? Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which shows you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. I've been on a, a, a marathon sprint, if you will, for a right. couple of years, but getting right. this business, you know, rapid ascendancy to to a, a certain station as a business 
And, and I mean, you know, you, you work with high performance entrepreneurs, you know what that takes. Like it's, yep. it's hard work. Um, but between talking to you, uh, talking to, I, I just inter- did an interview with John Acuff, who you probably know is a best-selling author. Um, oh, yeah, I know John. And watching some videos, uh, Alex Hormozzi is a guy I watch a lot. There's this like recurring theme lately around, uh, really, it's around essentialism. It's around do achieving more by doing less, um, more kind of self management. I've been uh, I, stoicism keeps popping up on my Instagram feed randomly for some reason. Uh, it's the, the universe is telling the universe me, is finding you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's telling me to to simmer, not boil. Don't cool off, but simmer, not boil, right? Um, so that's really, really interesting. So, do do you think that it's? Do you think you can almost standardize this into a formula that says, you know, the zero to one recipe where you have to overcome the the inertia of an object at rest, that's the hustle and grind, go, go, go. And then there's got to be this this transition into essentialism and and doing less through more or, or sorry, think, achieving more through less. Or is that is that too, too? I think that's an acceptable simplistic. way to think about it. I, I, I mean, I, I have come to distrust the hustle language and, and framing more over time. But, but I'm, I, I always have to sort of counter that even within myself because I say, well, yeah, but, but who am I talking to and who am I working with? And, and, and so I'm, I have a certain bias now. So you're, it, you're working with people that have already arrived yeah, at a certain level, I think, right? I think there is a risk of that. So I, I sort of, I think it's, a, I think I would say, yeah, it seems like an acceptable way of thinking about it. There's a 1.0 version and then a 2.0 version. And, and it's interesting you mentioned John, because I was reading his excellent book, um, soundtracks and and one of the one of his you know as you know because you just interviewed him but what the whole premise of the book is that we have certain mantras that we say to ourselves certain soundtracks that we have on repeat and some of those are really healthy and positive and lots of them aren't and so we we've heard them so often we sort of start to believe that they're true because repetition feels so familiar but actually they're still you know like bloodletting they're still totally wrong even if they're commonly believed by ourselves or by others. And one of the soundtracks he writes about, it was sort of one of the moments of meeting of the mind uh, between his work and mine, is that he created for himself a mantra when he decided to write this book. Um, His wife had come to him and said, you know, John, you're really not fun to be around for the two years you're writing your books. And then the two years you market them afterwards, you're really not fun to be around. So that means like, you know, her feedback is you're never fun to be around right, right. And, and which is an exaggeration. He has a great marriage and he's a great, he's a great dad, a great husband in lots of ways. And, and, but he said, okay, so the next time I write a book, I'm going to take the feedback though. And so he said, cause in writing, there's a, there's this mantra, this idea that writing is so hard. It's so terrible. There's a quote that says, all you have to do is, is, is get yourself, you know, get yourself to the, to the typewriter and bleed. That's all you have to do. And that this, that message is easy to believe. And then of course, if, it, if it's not awful, you think, well, it must, I must not be doing it right. I must not be trying hard enough. And, and, and then you, it all gets confusing. He said, okay, what if I took a different mantra and he chose this mantra, he called it light and easy. What if I just, everything I do on this new book, every time I sit down and write, just be light and easy, do this the light and easy way. What if that will work out? And I think what it happened for him is he ended up producing the best book he's ever written. And, and, that, and, the, and that's an opinion, but I, I think it's a terrific book that he's written. And it was through a light and easy mechanism, not a force it, grind it, stress it, hurt it, painful right. approach. And, and so it at least gives you an option. It says, well, what, what if I'm just pushing, I'm doing it the hard way. Hmm. I think, I actually believe now, and I, and I believe it more confidently now than I, when I was researching the book and more than when I wrote it, more than now that I'm teaching it, like, because, because I, the evidence is gathering for me that there really are two paths to execution, two paths to results. One is the harder, heavier path, it can produce results, but has all these unintentional externalities we're talking about. And then there really is an easier, lighter, more effortless approach. And as we start to even discover this, it's two options, not one. 
it, you suddenly you go, well, well, maybe there are essential things that I would love to achieve that are doable, that I've been procrastinating and I don't have to just beat myself up to get there. I just have to make the path a simpler path. Like I'm not, I'm not making this up stuff just from my own head, right? But like, let me use a case study of Warren Buffett, most successful investor in modern history. How did he do it? Did he grind it there? Did he, did he kill himself to get there? He said here, here are some of his quotes. Listen to these. He says, our investment strategy borders on lethargy. Right. Lethargy of all right. things to use that word. One more thing. He said, I'm not looking for investment investment, uh, you know, businesses uh, that I uh, like seven feet fences for me to leap over. I'm looking for one foot fences I can step over. Uh, what he's saying is he is putting in effort, but he puts it indifferently to other people. He's, he's looking for the right investments and the right ways forward that aren't so painful. And once he identifies the right ones, he invests for the long run. He invests in a deep way, but it works for him again and again and again. And so, so there is something here to this alternative strategy that is key for 10x performance. That, that's, that's what I am confident so, in. So, so let, me, let me maybe ask for, for nuance. And I don't want to repeat the same question I asked, but <laughs> it feels like what you just said begs, the, begs a, re, a restatement of the question, which is about this kind of this phased approach. Yes. Because you mentioned Warren Buffett. But yeah. he also is famous, I mean, this is apocryphal, but that supposedly by the time he was 11 years old, he had read every single book on investing <laughs> in business in the entire Omaha yeah. library system. Right, right. And, and, you know, even for you, like, like, what did it take to get your first book deal versus what does it take now to yeah. write a better book and even, get an even better book deal? Yeah. You know, and, and, and I know for me, I mean, so I, I almost just have to wonder if, Although obviously there's, there's profound truth in what you're saying, but is it just something that you have to earn? You kind of have to pay enough dues and get your ass kicked enough to earn the right to, to take the easy path. And, and maybe I'm jaded because I get hit up on social media since I'm known as an, you know, a, a guy that'll teach you how to make money because I teach yeah. you how to start businesses. Yeah. I get hit up so many times from people that they just want the easy path. Yes. And I'm wondering, are they wrong or am I wrong? <laughs> well, I don't think it's, I don't think it's either or, because I think, I mean, even if we take it as the, even if we take it as the, I mean, phased approach is one way of thinking about it, but an alternative is, of course, there are times when the easy path is just the wrong path, you know, that you're just looking for the get rich quick answer, you know, that, that and that is promised and offered and sold. And it's, it's a, uh, it's sort of just bad it's just bad, uh, you know, it's bad industry. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a, it's like, it's like going to the, to get your car fixed and, and you, it's hard to find an honest mechanic kind of thing. It's like hard to find an, someone who's honest in the, in the pay me to help you learn how to make money business. Right. Right. Uh, so, so yes, I do think that, that I do think that there is, there is reason to distrust the easy and effortless promises, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that, I am not arguing in favor of effort being a bad thing uh, at all. I teach my children to work. I believe in the gospel of work. I, I believe in it myself. So, you, you know, you could definitely, you could err on both sides of this. Right. You could definitely have people go, oh, just give me the, I'm not willing to do a thing, but just give me the get rich quick thing answer. Yeah, I don't believe in any of those. I, I'm not interested in any get rich quick scheme at all. Uh, I, back to Warren Buffett, he says, he says, the problem is everybody wants to be rich quickly. Uh, right. that's the problem. If you want to be rich over the long run, there is a, a way to do that. And it's consistency. That is that you have a lower bound of effort and a lower bound or, of effort or investment that mm -hmm. you say, I'm never going to do less than this, but never more than this. You, 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 and you keep it consistent over the long, long haul. And so that's what we're going for. If as soon as you try to say what I would describe as boom and bust investing or boom and bust behavior, mm -hmm. when you say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to run a marathon and I'm going to go. I know someone who didn't train for a marathon and went and ran a marathon and he ran one mile on and then walked a mile and he did the whole 26 miles without any preparation. And for a week, he couldn't move afterwards. Right. Right. Like, and that literally happened. He just killed his body to do it. He did it. 
Technically, that was achieved, but in the most unsustainable way imaginable. Right. So that's the problem with the boom and bust stuff, right? It's like, it's like no, don't think you can just make this happen in a heartbeat. We, we're so inconsistent as humans. The key is, is consistency. Can mm. you figure out systems, habits, yes, support systems as well that help you to consistently do things over time. And I, and I do think that the, that there are ways that you can over, you know, that you can get people to overstride so that they then cannot sustain it. And of course, I think that the opposite arguments are, are just as unhelpful. You don't have to do anything and you just get rich by paying me this money, right? Now, that's complete, you know, bill of goods as well. So mm -hmm. I think there's a sweet spot in here where it's before, it's before, it's like you have to have some self-awareness and you say, okay, before I get to the point of diminishing returns, stop. You know, you figure out what your point is and then that's your sweet spot and that's what you're going at. And that actually does feel more effortless than either mm -hmm. of the other extremes. To do nothing is not easy. To sit on the couch and to watch TV all day, I don't care what people say, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that you feel depressed. It's what, what when some, some author described as the dark playground. It's a terribly depressive state of suffering to be in that state all the time. All the time. It's not easy or effortless. To be overexerting and exhausted and burned out is not effortless. There's a sweet spot in between where you're doing what matters. You feel like you're doing the right things today. You're not overdoing it but you know that it's satisfying and that you start to be in, you start to be in flow. Life starts to work. Mm -hmm. so you start to feel right. And it's always adjusting to be in that place so that you can perform superbly for 50 years. That's what we're trying to, that's what I'm trying to optimize for. You know, Einstein said, and he was talking about mathematical proofs, but he, but he said it generally about life. He said, things should always be made as simple as possible, but never any simpler. Right. And I kind of feel like what I'm hearing from you is like you talked about your upper and lower bounds, like your upper bound should be, I should go, I should always go as hard as I can sustain, but never harder. Yeah. And your lower bound is I should always make things as easy as effective, as easy as is effective, but never easier. Yeah. I think that just stay in that range. I think so. I mean, there's a story that many people will have heard, but they might not know the whole story. It's back in the 1800s, the age of exploration. It's a time of, um, you know, people's imagination have been captured uh, both within the explorer, explorer community, but also community at large, a sort of equivalent of the space age, you know, who's going to put a man on the moon, it right. was that kind of fervor, and it was who was going to get to the South Pole first. Uh, Shackleton famously, of course, had failed, and they, they'd survived, and that's the impressive story there, but, but there were others that came after him that said, okay, well, he got closer uh, than others. No one had ever done it ever, not in, not in thousands of years of recorded history. No one had ever achieved it. The Vikings, the British empire, no one. And so finally there's these two teams, they set off almost the same day from two different locations and they just have a very different approach as to how they're going to go about this. The first team is a British team. They, their goal was basically to make as the maximum possible progress on the, po on the good weather days. Mm. But they would max out. They would go, you know, certainly 20, 30, maybe even more, sometimes 40. And if the weather was sufficient, you might even go 50 miles. I mean, tremendous progress. But what they didn't intend to do is that they then created this other downside. The dark side of that strategy is that they were on the bad weather days. They had no energy left to make any progress. So the opposition of the bad weather days meant that they just, you know, they just wiped out and they're just sitting in their tents, sometimes days on end. That's not good for them mentally either, making mm -hmm. no progress. They write in their journals. We're having the worst luck of any team that's ever tried to get to the South Pole. Uh, they were wrong about that, totally wrong. They had better weather than the, than the, than the team they were, uh, that they had been comparing their data to. Mm -hmm. But it felt like it was worse. And they said, another entry, they said, no team could make progress in weather like this, but one team could. And that was the Norwegian team they were competing against. The Norwegian head uh, expedition leader, had a different idea. He said, on the good weather days, no more than 15 miles. On the bad weather days, as close to 15 miles as possible. So it was a completely, like their mm. upper and lower bound was almost identical. Every day, every day, every day. So they kept doing this. Every day they're making this consistent process. But the plot thickens where they get within 45 miles of the South Pole. 
with perfect weather and perfect sledding conditions. So with one big push, they can make it there in one day. Not only that, they don't know where the British team is. So the British team could be just slightly behind or even ahead of them. Well, what would you do? What would you do? What would I do? What would everybody listening or watching this do? I mean, the temptation to just do it, I think would be too much. I think if I was honest, I would just give it one big push and make mm -hmm. it there. But they still, he keeps that discipline. And he, 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 they take three days averaging again, 15 miles per day to make it there. Now, where, where do they arrive? Do they arrive before the British team after what happens? That consistent approach gets them there 30 plus days sooner than the British team. Hmm. And that's the thing that should surprise us all because we've been sold a certain story, a certain narrative that says, push as hard as you can beyond your limits. That's always the faster way. And it isn't. It, it, it's a way to make a, to feel like you're going fast because in the moment of momentum, you go, oh, look at this. I'm making all this progress. But you not take an account of the dark side of the total like wiped out side. And so to try and get back to consistency, but not only that, not only did they beat them by 30 days, very importantly, they had sufficient energy to make the 16,000 mile journey home back to Norway safely. The British team didn't have that. They were demoralized, they were exhausted, they made it to South Pole, but they all died on the way home. And we only know of their account through their journal entries. If you go huh. back and read the brilliant biography, it's called Race to the Poles. And, and in that, it's a very, very well-written biography of that experience. Um, the biographer uses a phrase that just jumped off the page to me. I could hardly believe it. I hardly believe it still. He said the Norwegian team made progress in their pursuit. Here's the phrase, without particular effort. That's the phrase he used. It's unbelievable. It's impossible. It's an, it's, it's, it's an unthinkable thing for him to write. It was the physically most arduous goal that anybody in the explorer community in the world at large could devise. And yet they were to achieve, achieve their goal without particular effort. It, it's, um, it's, it's a monstrous thing to write. What, 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 a, what a shocking thing to say right. about, about, about such an achievement. And of course, I don't believe for a second, well, the count is obvious. It's not that they put in no effort. That's obvious. Uh, it's, 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 it is challenging. It's challenging almost every day in various ways. And yet that isn't the, the, the typifying description of the experience. That's not what it was. Yes, that was part of the journey, but it wasn't actually the defining trait. Consistency was the defining trait. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's, you know, that's a, that's an, if you figure out how to be consistent at something, be consistent in my marriage. I don't want to be consistent. I don't want to be great for one week and rubbish for three months and then great again for a week. I mean, that's not going to make a great marriage. Mm -hmm. and I'm 21 years into this, right? And, and uh, we, 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 I got to live my marriage in a way that it, it lasts forever. Uh, and the same for an entrepreneur, right? You have to figure out a way to be able to be successful for a long period of time and, and, and consistency. You know, how, do you make it, how do you make it as effortless as possible to be able to do the things that are the most important things. To me, that's a, that's a thought experiment worth spending at least a portion of our time on uh, so that we can get this balance that we've been talking about right. So it seems like then, because again, you know, I live as an entrepreneur and an educator of entrepreneurs. Right. You know, I, I, I live, although idealistically, I live in this abundance world where there's, you know, everything is plentiful and there's, you know, room for everyone to succeed. But in, in, in purely capitalistic terms, there's, there's always this slightly like zero sum aspect of like, you know, I gotta, I gotta get mine. Right. Um, you know, not everybody wins in capitalism, sadly, or, well, or I, I don't even think it's sad. I actually think that's just the way it is. But, but my point is it, so as somebody who's like, I don't know that I will ever get my brain to stop asking the question, well, what's the edge? What's my edge, right? Yes. Um, in, the, in a competitive marketplace. So it sounds like the edge then is, is about how do you, and I'll use, a, I'll use like an automotive metaphor, how do you tune your engine so that your optimal rate of consistent output is higher then the next guy, and I use like like 55 miles per hour, right? Was supposedly the, the the optimum speed to run a car for you know speed of of covering ground 
coupled with the balancing, balancing the concern of energy consumption, right? Mm. That's why they passed speed limits during the oil embargo in the mm. early 70s. And so I, the theory was, oh, well, every car runs best at 55 miles per hour, but not every car runs best at 55 miles per hour. Yeah. Like a Porsche runs better at like 95 wants, miles per wants hour. Wants to go faster. Yeah. Tesla and so how do you faster. tune your engine? So, yeah. and, and it's like the sharpening the saw idea. Cause like, I, I want my consistency to still be faster than the next guy's <laughs> consistency. Right. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I like that metaphor and, and coming back to the real question, because the, the, the real question you keep posing is how do I have an edge? Yeah. And I love that question. I think that's a really solid question. And it's just to not have the answer immediately be, well, it's to work harder. Yeah, that's all it is. It's just saying, well, that might be the answer. That's one strategy. And it definitely works. So there are plenty of examples that is true for. But what about the times it's not true? Or what about what, what if what if you get your edge by making things simpler than your competitors? Mm -hmm. That's a very different strategy. But but like, how about let's have an example? Okay, if you could, if we you and I could go into the in a time machine, let's go back to 1972. We get out. We can invest one dollar in every company in the S and P five hundred, right? One dollar. We get back in the time machine. We go forward thirty years. Now we get out of the time machine. Which company gives the largest return on your investment over that thirty year period? I mean, I kind of want to put you on the spot now, but I don't. Really yeah, well, so in the from what from seventy to 2000? 72 to two thousand two. I'm not even going to, we, we're almost out of time. So I'm not even going to waste your be, time. And you, and you know what, 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 what's, what's, what's fun about this is that, is that even if we had an hour, unless, and not just you, I'm not trying to put you on this, but right, that right. wasn't really the point. I've, I've done this with whole audiences, even the audiences of a thousand people, that kind of thing. And we can go on to the point of it being painful. No one will ever get, the only way anyone ever guesses it is by, they don't guess it, they, they just cheat. They just go online and they get the answer. Right. The answer isn't Apple or Google. The answer isn't Exxon Mobil. It's not McDonald's. It's not like, it, it, it's Southwest Airlines. That's the answer. Mm, okay. How did they do it? Now, I'm not saying there was no effort, but but that wasn't the the... That's not the primary differentiator. And they didn't try and do everything for everyone. That is definitely not their differentiator. What gave them the edge was simplification. They, 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 they removed all sorts of things that the competitors thought were absolutely necessary. There's this great example of when like the competitors were all creating, uh, they're, they're all investing in the same system, the same digital technology system for printing uh, your tickets. And because everyone else was doing it, it became, it started, it started to feel like, well, if we don't do it, we're going to be left behind. And either that's not great. And, and it's going to cost them $2 million to install it. And that's just, you know, then it costs the maintenance costs year after year. Mm -hmm. It's a multi-million dollar investment. And they're talking about it as a team. And somebody said, well, do we even care what somebody else thinks is a ticket? And they're all like, we don't care. We're trying to do a different thing here. We want to be different to them. And it's like what you're saying, we need an edge. And they said, well, let's just use our existing receipt machine and we'll just print on it in big letters this is your ticket that's exactly what they did they <laughs> saved millions and millions of dollars tons of effort and they they sidestepped what everyone else was doing and they got an edge by doing it a simpler way an easier way in fact that's an example of like if you can invert the problem hmm. right now now that one in one one way you can invert it, oh, no one else is doing anything, I'll work harder. That is its own kind of inversion. But once you're past a certain point, the, the bigger inversion is to say, not how can I do more to get better results, but you say, how can I make it easier to get better results? How yeah. can I rethink this? So you start to have mental exertion over physical exertion. You start to create space to think and be smarter than the other people. And that's what Southwest has done in many, many instances. And that's why they've been able to be so incredibly profitable over such a long period of time. That's Southwest. We could do the whole same story, bait just about. But for Apple, most valuable company on the planet, depending on what day it is, did they do it by simply working harder than everyone else? Well, it's not like they haven't put effort in. You can't, you can't question that. But that's not been their primary competitive advantage. The primary one is that they've removed complexity. Others yeah. have did it more simply than their competitors. And, and you can say the same, for, we could keep going through examples. Uh, and so, so how to get an edge, love that question. Let's just open up the answers beyond what the, the narrow traditional 80s view is mm -hmm. of the answer so that we can open this up, I think, to a greater number of entrepreneurs.
you know, I just did a just did a thing. Final riff on this. I just did a thing with a with a, a, a with a great company. It's called Bigelow, and they specialize in selling, um, uh, you know, entrepreneur owner manager businesses. So started by the entrepreneur, they built it for 25 years. Now they want to sell it, but they're worried about it. They don't want to just the highest price even necessarily. They want the right next owner to take right. over. Well, they specialize in this area, and they did research with a, with, a, with a major business schools and found that that actually entrepreneurs are more risk averse than the general populace, which they did not expect to find. It is a surprise, and you know, maybe not a surprise to you or to those that work constantly with entrepreneurs, because it's not a higher risk pro proposal. It's just, it's just thinking about risk in a different way and thinking about how to construct things differently. In that same way, I think we can, we can dislocate some of these narratives and stories about entrepreneurship from what actually works, from what actually helps. It might not make the front page of the Wall Street Journal, uh, but in a way, you don't want to make the front page of the Wall Street Journal. You don't want to make it, you don't want to have to uh, suddenly a peak experience that gets the news, and you don't want a sudden fall from grace that you often get with the same kind of high risk strategies. What you want is to just be consistently performing well, maximizing your personal and family freedom while also delivering great value to other people over time. That's really the entrepreneurial promise in, from mm. my estimation. And I think, I think effortless and essentialism, I think both books, both sets of ideas can be a helpful part of the conversation. So I have an observation, but I wanna make sure that everybody knows, because I started off talking about essentialism, which was that, that was your first book? That's right. It's my first, okay. first big solo book, yeah. And you have Effortless, which how long has that been out? That's relatively new, right? It's just a few months, but yeah. Few months, it's okay. New York Times bestseller. It's been performing better than Essentialism did by the same time. So I've been very, very fortunate. And I think it's because, I think it's because pe so many people are highly engaged, but just teetering on that edge of exhaustion. I think it's had the power of relevancy for that reason. It's definitely timely. I, I think that's, that's for sure. So obvious question, silly question. Was it, was it a much easier book to write? Uh, that's a good question, right? And and I'll give you an honest answer. I, I think I made it, you know, that question, I think one of the best questions in it, Effortless is, how am I making this harder than it needs to be? Mm -hmm. And I made it harder than it needed to be in one way, almost throughout the whole time. And that was that I, I spent too much time just worried about it, just worrying, you know? And the truth is, is if you've got enough time to worry, then you've got enough time to be grateful, for example. And I instigated a new rule. Uh, it's under the category I would describe of a sort of radical gratitude or, or something. Uh, every time I complain, every time I worry, I will say something I am thankful for. And what I learned from that is that, is that everything, that single strategy will make everything, no matter what you're doing and no matter how hard it is, it will make it a little easier. And, and ingratitude or just, you know, we don't think about it as ingratitude, but when we're complaining, when we're worrying, it will just make everything that much harder. Mm -hmm. You know, despite, like that spy movie, I can't remember the name of it, but remember the, remember the, 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 the movie um, and, and it is this Russian spy that was over here and whenever he was in a terrible situation, he would stay calm the whole time. And, and the, the, uh, the, the, the other protagonist is like, why are you always so calm? And he just says, well, would it help? You know, would it help to be all bent out of shape? Would it help to complain that I'm a victim of everything? It doesn't help anything to go forward. And, mm -hmm. and so I, what, what I learned, and I learned it not just in writing the book and my errors in my approach to that, but also in um, when my, my daughter, I write about this in the book at the end of the book, but, but when my daughter became very, very sick and very suddenly and inexplicably sick, I learned this lesson, which is if you focus on what you lack, then you lose what you have. And if you focus on what you have, you will gain what you lack. And, and, so, and so it's not that life isn't hard. Life is full of hardship, but it's the way we respond to it determines whether it, we make it even harder than it needs to be, or we find something that is a more humane, more healthy way to achieve productivity. Mm. Well, I, I, man, I have so much more I'd like to say, but in the interest of time, I, I, that's actually a pretty solid note to probably let just hang in the air. Um, this is this has been a really great conversation. 
Uh, and, and only because I, I know from, from listening to you on Tim Ferriss that you are open sometimes at least to coming back on people's shows for second interviews. I'm wonder, I'm hopeful that at some point I could have you back because I think you've just given me as, as many questions as answers. Um, but this has been wonderful, Greg. Thank you really, really for being a guest on our show. I appreciate you. It's really my pleasure. You've made it lots of fun. And, and, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you later. Good, good. So I just want to kind of wrap it up. Uh, effort, uh, sorry, Essentialism, Effortless, a new book that's out. Where else can people go to get more from you? I know you have a website, social media. Please do share. Uh, yeah, the only thing I would say to people, we have a, a newsletter we, we started not very long ago. Um, it's called The One Minute Wednesday. Uh, people can sign up for it at uh, gregmcewen.com. And uh, it's been, it seems to be very well received. It's like we're trying to create just the shortest, most succinct one minute of, uh, of like tune up. Uh, around these ideas. And uh, that would be maybe the one thing I'd recommend. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely gonna love this one. Check it out. I don't believe in writer's block. I believe in idea bankruptcy. My business is built off the strength of my ideas. If you are casual about your ideas, you will write a crappy book. So the first step is you gather ideas. Great, easy way to do that is to say, what's a question that won't leave me alone? 